Um, so welcome back. It is so wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Judith McGarry. I'm the founder and executive director of the Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance. I'm an attorney. Please don't hold that against me. Um, and I'm also a farmer who raises grass-fed lamb and beef and a very, very small orchard. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more. Um, I will say there's been a, a change on the agenda. Unfortunately, um, Jason was unable to join us today. So um, we have two wonderful presenters on this panel. And what we're gonna do is just move through both presentations um, and then do the Q&A at the end. So I'm gonna introduce both of our speakers. The first one is gonna be Coley Burgess. Um, he hails from a large conventional row crop family. Um, he's starting in 2013, he began his journey to holistic farming. He currently runs 20 head of cattle in a 15 acre orchard. And then Mark, B Mark, I totally messed up as a moderate, Biagi, thank you. Um, grew up on a grass-based dairy and has worked on a variety of ag operations from large corporations to his own regenerative mixed livestock operation. So we'll be hearing from each of those. If you'll please um, join me in welcoming Coley to the stand. So my name is Coley Burgess. I come from a, a small town of a, uh, about 300 people. It's a little bit south of Carlsbad, New Mexico, pretty close to the Texas border. Um, like she said, I grew up on a conventional farm. My dad had a couple thousand acres that we did uh, row crop farms on. He had, uh, he did some minimum till, but of course minimum till relies uh, on a lot of spraying. Um, and uh, I thought I wanted to farm, but he told me, you know, like a lot of uh, young ag kids, I had to go get a degree and spend at least two years working off the farm before he would let me come back and, and do the farm. So I, I left. I had way too much fun in school. I spent about 10 years in college. I got degrees in math, engineering, physics, and electrical engineering. Spent a couple of summers as a nuclear engineer up in um, Washington State at the Naval Shipyard up there and ended up then going, working in a potash mine for 13 years. And, it, and it's kind of ironic that in that 13 years, I have been weaning myself off of uh, potash and uh, all of the other fertilizers as we've journeyed into our uh, regenerative um, journey. So silvopasture, um, I didn't even know we were doing silvopasture. Uh, whenever we started, we, we bought an orchard in 2011 and uh, it took us a while to realize that the previous management practices maybe weren't the best. And um, through luck and accidents and observations, uh, we, we kind of journeyed into a path of regenerative ag in a pecan orchard, just because that's a, what we had bought and what we were working with. So silver pasture is simply the deliberate integration of trees and grazing livestock operations on the same land. Um, and we've expanded on this as we've gone. We have grazed multi-species now. Um, we, we focus a lot on soil cover, animal nutrition, and uh, there's added benefits, biochar being one of those. So my goals, uh, it's not only the soil health, but it's to grow the, the most nutritious beef around, um, the best pecans you've ever tasted, uh, the chickens that we raise out there, I, I want to have the, the, the most nutrient dense and best tasting chickens that you've ever had. So the, those are our goals and we achieve the, uh, I think we're achieving that through soil health and, and the principles that we've adopted. Um, and then we've, we've tried to do a lot of value adding. Um, our place is too small, I still have to have a day job so I can't farm full time like I would li like to. So uh, I wrote my wife into do, ma making pies, roasting pecans. We go to the farmer's market and stuff. Uh, we try to do a lot of value adding and she's in a phenomenal cook. Um, we even, some of the things that we do, she'll use pecans in the crust. So she makes a cheesecake that has pecans in it. So, you know, we're still um, using that, that avenue to sell our products. And so here's just a picture of our place. It's a 15 acre orchard. We're able to keep roughly 15 to 20 head of cattle, and this year we added the sheep, um, from May through November. Now, nobody wants a pecan that a cow's crapped on, so we pull the cows out in November when the pecans start to fall, but the dung beetles are still active. They're going through, they're, they're uh, spreading the manure pats out, 
and, and sterilizing them. They get plenty of sunlight down where we are. And uh, so by the time we're actually, you know, getting a good nut drop and we go through the harvest, everything is sterile on the soil. Um, and putting the cattle into the orchard is, is mutually beneficial. Of course, the, the cattle are recycling nutrients and putting it into a plant available form. And uh, one of the unexpected benefits that we didn't know when we started, cattle love the taste of the pecan leaves. And uh, I like my orchard to look neat whenever you're driving by. All of the rows line up, but there's no sprigs coming off of the bottom. And uh, it's kind of wasted um, energy for the tree. Those things, they're not going to get any sunlight on those leaves anyways. So it used to take us about a week. We'd go through by hand and pull all of them off as high up as I could reach. Um, your hands would be black and green for a couple of weeks whenever you finish that. Well, now the cows do it for us. So there's a whole week's worth of work that's gone. And my kids absolutely love that we no longer have to go out and pick those off. And the orchard looks really well. And uh, like I said, multi-species, we um, started with sheep this year. And um, they, they were a much larger pain than the cows. So we went from st single strand hot wire to three strand. Um, just to kind of keep them where, where they belong with the cows and not jumping out because once one of them gets out, a couple of more go through and then the cows are really tempted to test the hot wire again. And uh, we have done meat chickens. We have layer chickens out in the orchard too. And we flood irrigate our farm out of the Pecos River. So um, even though we live in the desert, we do get some irrigation water, but it depends on how much rain they had up north and how much the reservoirs catch. So you can see our orchard is, is the, divided up into six different uh, benches. We call them a bench. And there's a border in between each one. So whenever you flood, it'll go from north to south. The, the water stays and you can push ahead down really fast. It's much more efficient for flood irrigation, even though it's really inefficient. But just so you know, the, where the trees are, we call a bench. And in between, there's a border. You can see the strips in between. And I point that out because our uh, rotational grazing started as an accident. We got one milk cow. Our daughter had um, GERD. She would projectile vomit like two or three times a day. And we had read where uh, raw milk would help tame that down. We found a raw milk guy, got some. It seemed to help, so we got one dairy cow and we started putting her out in the orchard to graze so we weren't feeding as much hay. And then realized, hey, if, if we skip one bench and don't irrigate it, we can leave her out there and irrigate the other five. Next irrigation, we move her over, we skip that one, and, and that's just how we accidentally started our rotational grazing. And then I took a class at HMI with uh, Ralph Tate one-on-one, -on -one, and he said, well, hey, let's tighten this up. And that's when I got into daily moves. So um, our, here's rotational grazing. I, we have our fence kind of semi-permanent set up down the border of, uh, in between each bench of trees. And then we'll run a cross fence in between those. So um, a lot of the principles that apply out on pastures and other farmland apply in an orchard. We just have trees that uh, get in the way. Some of the things aren't quite as convenient, but um, we, we do a lot of this. And, and whenever we bought the orchard, we were told that anything that's not a tree is going to steal water from your trees and it's going to mess up harvest. So the, the way that we harvest, you shake the trees, the nuts fall on the ground, and then you go through, you sweep them into rows, and then you pick them up with the tractor and the harvester. And, and so I spent the first two years with a backpack sprayer out there, and I mean, there's, it's, it was bare as a baby's butt, except for little you know, weeds coming up this tall. I was afraid we we're gonna mess up harvest. So I was out spraying everything, or I would till and do all sorts of stuff. And then um, once we had the milk cow, started letting the grass come up and tested it once or twice with the harvester. And, um, we could harvest through things. And then in 2014, I, our normal rainfall is 12 inches in a year. And previous year, we got three inches. But in 2014, we got 25 inches of rain in two weeks. Couldn't put the cows out there to graze. I couldn't go through and shred. I couldn't do anything. And then the grass grew really, really well. And the pecans started falling. And so we harvested through knee to thigh high grass and weeds. And, and we did it fine. The, the harvester, the sweeper went through, it did okay, the harvester was fine. I know we left a few nuts, but after that, it, it's kind of been game on. I, we have planted um, probably 100 different varieties of seeds in there for cover crop, testing what works, what doesn't, what grows in the shade, what grows in the sun, 
uh, our soils are saline, so it, it's just been game on trying to figure out what will work. Um, so here's, here's some of what we've been able to do, um, and that's alfalfa and Bermuda grass. That's, I mean, our cows aren't the small breed. These are Brangus cattle. They're fairly tall, um, you know, so they're, they're in chest-high Bermuda and uh, alfalfa out there. Um, with 20 head in, in through here, you know, it would take us almost two weeks to move through an acre and a half. And um, like I said, in, anything you can do on pasture, we, we can still do in the orchard. We um, calve in the orchard, uh, still rotating them. Um, there's, there's not a lot of difference except for the trees that are out there. And who doesn't like a picture of a cute baby calf? Um, and so the cover crops, uh, whenever we started looking at cover crops, I called up a local seed company, I and mean, local was three hours away, but uh, talked to them on the phone, asked, told them what I wanted to do in my orchard, and they said, oh no, it'll never work, and they actually talked themselves out of a seed cell, telling me what I couldn't do in my own orchard. So, um, yeah, I went, went somewhere else, I didn't tell them what I was doing, I just bought the seed and planted it. Um, and, and it's worked out really well for us. Um, the, the ones that work well that we've done so far, chicory, St. Foen, plantain, um, yellow clover, some white clover, alfalfa does well, rye, uh, annual rye, brome grass. And so my latest mix this fall, I, I lost a lot of my diversity over the last few years thinking perennials would grow forever, but they won't. Um, so we had to replant and that's what I planted this fall. And uh, that's my, my daughter, who was about this high at the time, standing behind a, a stalk of African cabbage. Our animal nutrition, we use a 20-way mineral feeder. Um, some people try to convince me that it doesn't work, but the more I read on, um, I go through Fred Pervenza's book of um, nutrition and EcoFarm and all of these other books, I think it confirms more and more that, that this type of a feeder is, is at least what's gonna work best for us. So this is part of that growing more nutritious food, uh, minerally balanced, complete uh, uh, food that's gonna taste better and be better for us. And so some of the observations, um, you know, trying to figure out if, if everything we're doing works. Um, I have a neighbor, he grows alfalfa and he'll put his cows out there in the fall and whenever he comes back in the spring and he's ready to start grazing it, uh, he has to go through and, and he's got tractor tires, you know, pulled with chains and he has to go through and bust all of the, the cow patties up uh, manually. He, you know, it's been, he's been, he'll spend a day out there in his truck just dragging tractor tires behind it to bust them up. And uh, this is roughly 24 hours after we've moved the cows out. So somewhere between 24 and 48 hours, the dung beetles and earthworms are just going nuts. And within three days, something that was a foot in diameter will be three or four feet in diameter. It's spread out and completely sterilized uh, and being used by the bacteria, fungi, earthworms, uh, and all of the other good soil critters. Um, we planted new trees in part of, an orchard, in part of the orchard. Um, we've had grass and a few other things growing out there. Um, we have a hard pan layer, and we also have what they what subby soil. It'll hold water for a long time. The, the um, previous owner, of course, he had the trees out there, but no grass or anything else, and said that water would stand in, in places so long it would actually rot the tree roots, and he couldn't get trees to grow in various places. And now that we've been doing this since roughly 2014, one of these, I think there's just Bermuda grass roots 30 inches down. We have drainage. Um, whenever we flood irrigate, we put on three inches of water. I can put cattle back out there in four days and they won't leave a hoof print. Um, whenever we bought the farm, we, if we stepped out there, um, it, it would take about seven days before we could get back out in the orchard or it would be too slick. And then once it did dry up, I, did, I forgot to get a picture of it, but it looked like a dry lake bed. So from day seven to day eight, it went from slick to a dry lake bed with the one inch cracks in the soil and everything. So. Um, a lot of what we're doing, it, it has to be working, just the, the observations that we see. Um, and this is the neighbor with alfalfa out there. Um, we got, a, a, it actually rained a few weeks ago. 
So that was his place and our place was on the right. So we had really good water penetration in our place. You can see the tracks where the cows are just starting to leave hoof prints in some of the bare spots. We're not quite 100% covered. Um, if we get more, it, it used to be if we got a half inch of rain, we had to pull the cows out to keep them from pugging the ground or we'd lose pecans. We're now up to an inch and a quarter. So that, that gives you a lot more breathing room whenever the storms roll in. And whenever we hit about an inch and a quarter, then we'll go out and we have to pull them out of the orchard so they don't start to do this. And this actually isn't too bad. I can harvest right through this. But if it gets much more wet, well, you'll see in a minute. Um, portable water. Uh, we, if we've, uh, in the past, strung 900 feet of garden hose out there and just hooked it up to the municipal water and, and drug water hoses around. Um, which basically means I'm the only person that could move water because I'm, I'm it was the only one big enough to drag enough water hose around. So I finally buried a one inch poly line through, right through the middle of the orchard and now there's taps along the way and it's only a couple of hundred feet. So we can still move the water around. Um, it's not quite as convenient. The one on the right we used to have, it was one of those little garden truck things you get from a, a garden dirt bucket you get from Tractor Supply. Um, I sealed it up and I went to a bigger one uh, over here. So uh, they don't have to fight over water. There's more water available. And uh, so some of the, the adapting tools, our old harvester, the, the picture on top, my, my oldest daughter's on the tractor right there. The, the rows have already been swept up. And uh, she's on the tractor with the old harvester um, that's from the 1970s and once we I, I learned of this other machine where we could do without having to sweep into rows, we could have a different style of harvesting. So I actually upgraded. I went from the 1970s to the 1950s <laughs> to get the machine on the bottom that works better for us. Uh, so I have a Big Mac nut harvester for sale if anybody would like one. <laughs> Our biochar. Um, we use the, the previous owner, so whenever you shake out the pecan trees, you get a lot of, of wood that shakes out. And um, we used to pull it out and we would burn it all over in a big fire. Well, I just took an old 500 gallon tank, you, you kind of feed it and we create our own biochar. And this year we'll look at inoculating it and uh, having a much better system. And um, this is what happens when your float doesn't quite work right. You can imagine, I mean, there's, there's probably $100 worth of pecans lost right there. So every time that happens, my kids hate it. I send them out there with rakes whenever it dries up a little bit and they kind of have to go out and smooth it up. And uh, one of the last things, so on the picture on the right, that we were drilling uh, to put in new trees and that's actually a hard pan of caliche. It's a solid rock that is underneath our orchard. And uh, you can drill through it. It's about 10 inches thick. It'd take you a couple of hours with a auger on the back of a tractor. You can actually drill all the way through it. And then um, my daughter right there, she's holding mesquites. That's one thing, since we don't till or anything else, we go out and we pull mesquites by hand or clip and spray. And um, that, that's a lot of work that is required for this style of management. All right, and that's it. There we go. Good morning. My name is Mark Biaggi. I am the ranch manager at Tomcat Ranch. Um, we're located on the central coast of California, um, just a little south of San Francisco. It's kind of a unique place. So, you know, there's a few million people over the hill. And then you have a town of, I don't know, a few hundred people that uh, it's, it's that part of California is still very agricultural, even though we're located in, a, you might say, an urban area. Um, my journey, I grew up on a, um, I kind of like to joke, uh, we didn't know that cows were supposed to be on concrete. So they grazed year round and uh, two, twice a day they went in the barn and got milked and, and they adapted and lived in that environment. It was a, uh, to be honest, it was a very profitable, profitable um, operation. Um, it was really good for the land and the people. But like a lot of American agriculture, we didn't have a good succession plan, so went out of the family. Um, so my journey has taken me through uh, studying 
Agriculture University, working in a couple countries, working for several large corporations. I kind of like to joke, I worked on the dark side for a couple summers doing some uh, pesticide, herbicide application up and down the Mississippi and in the Northwest. Um, scared the hell out of me. What I saw was already happening on the farms. Um, went home for 17 years back to a little ant bed and everything we raised we sold local. Um, and wound up coming to Tomcat Ranch in 2017 because I was very interested in what they were doing to work with the scientists in collaboration because I wanted to know what we were doing, how it was impacting the soil. Because too often we do things out there, we try things, and it looks like it works, and we do it again, and it works, and then a year later it stops. And it told me a lot that we didn't really understand what was going on. Um, so that's, a, that's my journey, and that's how I got there. Tomcat Ranch, we're, uh, some people call us a learning lab. I think of us as a hybrid. We're a working cow-calf to finisher, sell our own beef. We also do research with our partners from Point Blue, and we also do have an educational component, and it's all about regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, we saw a lot of people through the ranch, all, all uh, associated with regenerative agriculture. We don't do weddings or any of that kind of events. It's always around agriculture. Um, our mission when I got there was to inspire people to manage their lands more regeneratively on about a million acres. And we kind of tracked that and surpassed that. And so, as usual, you bump it up and say, hey, how can we go out and influence more people? Um, and a lot, because of our connections, a lot of times we're influencing people who have uh, large net worths or work in a lot of agencies, and so they touch a lot of land masses. Um, for me personally, I think the biggest challenge is, is, is the paradigm shift. And it doesn't matter if it's the folks here in the room or the folks that are living in urban environments because I don't often think that people connect when they turn that tap on where that water came from. Uh, water's always been my driver. Uh, carbon to me is a sexy thing. It's a modern thing. It's a new fad. But water's what drives us. And I've lived in several places where you did turn the tap on and water sometimes showed up and sometimes didn't. Um, and it's, it's left a, a long impression on me. Um, so this is what Tomcat looks like. This is one of our flatter pastures. Uh, we do have a lot of steep ground when I tell people that you can fall out of some of our pastures, you can. Um, we have added goats this year. To me, when I got to the ranch, it spoke of sheep and goat country, not cattle country. Uh, because we're so vertical and we have so much brush. We really brought them in to deal with fuel load, but also to get some biodiversity of the species above ground and start managing and harvesting what is grown. We do a number of different things there. One of the things I feel very responsible to do is to run unique trials that the average farmer, rancher cannot run because I have a budget. And I have X amount of money, so go do something unique. Try to figure something out. Um, so in the process, a little more history before I dive into that, about Tomcat. This is, this is to me, a, a good measure of what we've been trying to do. If we use native perennial grasses in California as our proxy for how we are managing the land, in 2011, with Point Blue's uh, partnership, they... This is the home place, 1,800 acres. They cut up into 75 monitoring uh, units, you might say, of pasture. And that very first year, they went out and they did a survey and they could only find native perennials in eight out of those 75. Two years later, in 2013, they're up to 55, or excuse me, 58 out of 75. Now, all they did was start moving the cows. Realized before, 20, before 2011, they really didn't know that much. They were just learning about holistic management. Okay, and so it was, it was learn as you go. But the main thing was they moved the cows. There's a lot of set stock grazing that still goes on in our area. A lot of people believe in it. Uh, sometimes you talk to folks and they say they're rotational grazing. They move them every six months or they move them when they're out of grass. And I think what happened here, I wasn't here at Tomcat because I didn't arrive till 17. But I think what happened here is we have the native perennials there and give them an opportunity to flourish and to recover. Um, we, um, I think, all here earlier from England mentioned about a three month drought. If you know anything about the Mediterranean climate in California, six months with no rain is not a drought. That's just normal. 
Um, so every year it's gonna dry out really badly. Um, and you need plants that are adapted to that climate and that's why we need our native perennials. So by 2018, we had 70 out of 75 of those pastures. Now we could detect native perennials in there. And it tells me that we're doing something right. Um, trying to figure that out and trying to figure out the other things that we're doing and how to move this land along has been our goal. So what I really wanted to talk about was safe to fail. And safe to fail is a, um, a thought process, a practice that I picked up from a gentleman by the name of Graham Hand out of Australia. And it's, in a nutshell, it's the concept that every year you should do a half a dozen things that if every one of them completely failed will not affect your business at all because they're so small. But if you don't, you're not going to know any more 12 months from now than you do today. And, and I realized I had been sort of doing that most of my life, but hadn't been doing it in an organized manner. And I also realized that Tomcat that some of, when I first got there in 17, we set up some science trials not knowing whether those things would even work at Tomcat. And we shouldn't have. We set them up too big. And what we should have done was start out with these safe to fails. Does this even work in this environment? Do we understand our context enough to see will this tool, will this practice work here? Instead of just assuming it will. And so we've really moved to the safe to fail. And every year I'm trying to have those half a dozen things. And sometimes it takes several years to actually see the results. You just keep monitoring, did it actually work? And when I say work, I'm always starting with water infiltration. And then I'm starting looking at plant production, then plant biodiversity, and then ultimately the animals. But is there some part of that journey it worked? So the one I want to talk about today as we did was bale grazing. And if anybody's familiar with bale grazing or not, in a nutshell, you're just putting bales out on the ground, generally large bales out here or further into the Midwest and up into Canada. I think you guys use a lot of round bales in California. It's hard to get them. We have to use square bales. It's all designed for the dairies. But we're putting out a, a thousand pound bales on a grid and we're grazing them off with cattle, the same as if you're grazing a pasture. And we're quote unquote wasting 20 to 30% of it. But we're not, we're feeding the soil. What we had to do is we had to adjust this to our context. So if you read the literature, it says do it in the wintertime. The ground's hard and frozen. If we do it in the wintertime, Mediterranean climate, we're raining, we're on clay. We're going to destroy that ground. So we actually do it right before the fall rains if we can catch them. We're trying to do it September, October. I want it as close as I can to the rain, that the microbes don't get dried out in the manure, that the rains come along, utilize all that nutrition we've left behind there. So this is... This is one of our pastures. I think this was two years ago we started our first one. Just a small thing. Uh, we only did it for a week or two just to see what would happen. This is what some of our topsoils look like. Uh, it's not what a lot of people think about topsoils, but these are highly compacted soils because they were farmed for years, ground that probably should have never been turned over. Uh, the, uh, you're on clays, you're on steep enough ground. A lot of this had to be farmed with crawler, tractor. I think a lot of our uh, topsoil, historic topsoil is sitting down in the estuary, is no longer in the land. You can see by that, those colors, that orange color, we have a lot of oxidation, we have a lot of plating. This is actually a piece of ground we did bale grazing. And what you see growing out of the top there was ryegrass that we did not plant, was not in the field until we bale grazed it, and all of a sudden we have two foot grass coming out of the field. But more importantly to me was what it did to the water infiltration. So here's our safe to fail. We didn't set up anything too particular. Put the bales out, graze them, step over. We didn't have the bales. You don't have the quote unquote waste what's going on. So here's, here I am taking a picture straight down of, it's in April. We've done this in October, the year before. This is what the ground looks like. There's our great forage we're growing. That's what it looks like in the test. Okay, just a few feet apart. So top left corner, that's what it looks like when we, in December, when the rains came that year, of where we bale grazed. It looked like a disaster, a bomb went off. It also looked to me like 500 years ago, if a thousand head of elk had come through our country, they probably left it the same way until a wolf or a, or a grizzly bear pushed them off. They thrashed it and moved on and let it recover. Um, bottom left is April 2021, that same area. It is coming back lush. We tried to have the cows graze, we tested them in March, they did not like it. We hadn't got enough rain, the nutrients hadn't cycled, they were angry. We put them in there for about four or five hours and took them out. It was like this, this, this feed, they can tell better. It looks green, it's good, but they don't like it. 
So we wait until June. Here's June that's going in the top right corner. Yes, it's drying out. The cows liked it. The cows did well. Bottom right corner is back to April. So this is what your test and control looks like. And uh, if you can see, there's a little stick there in the back. That's, a, that's just a hammer I'm packing out in the field. So it shows you that we barely covered the head of a hammer on our control, what we were grazing in that pasture. Yet when we did this bale grazing, we're getting 12, 18 inches in April, and it still had much more growing season. I always joke I'm looking for the chia pet. I'm looking for something I do out there that is so dramatically big that I can't ignore it, and I got I to gotta stay with it. So where do we go next? We looked at the water infiltration. We had a 600% increase in the water infiltration just in four or five months. That tells me a lot, especially on that kind of compacted soil. We've also seen a, a really good increase in our growing. So where are we going next? This was last fall, 15 acres. You can see as we're progressing across there with 100 head of cattle in strips. And we're going to be monitoring. This year we've set up another field with Point Blue and we're actually looking at what we are doing now under the soil. I want to see not only what, what we're doing with water infiltration, I want to see how we're changing the biology, the fungi, the minerals. We also are going to be looking at the, bio, the biodiversity of the plants. How are the plants reacting to it? And do we get more perennials? We know we'll get more annuals, but do we get more perennials and are they more robust? Because those perennials will grow through our dry season. They will hang in there. Um, so that's uh, and the last piece is I really think this is all about a paradigm shift for all of us. We have to look at things differently. It allows us to allow other things, other concepts and tools to come into our lives and deal with them. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple, three websites there, especially I want to point out the profiles of land management. If you're interested in not looking at anything Tomcat's done or influenced, this was done by some of my, my uh, colleagues and other people, went around the United States and interviewed people who were doing regenerative agriculture. Some of them didn't even know they were doing regenerative agriculture. And it's a really good story of how they did economics and biodiversity and ecology all in one package. So thank you very much. So I'd like to, first of all, pick up on something I heard in completely different ways from both of y'all and ask you to expand on it just a bit. Um, you actually picked up on it more explicitly, which is the mindset, the, the, the how you thought process. But what caught me about that, particularly again, the theme is you, you came from a conventional background. You know, you started in the conventional world and then there was this change and you, you touched on it, but you didn't really dig. And then you're, you're doing so much on converting people. Can you all talk a bit more about what it takes to mindset change? And particularly one of the things that I see also is not only the mindset change from conventional to regenerative, but sometimes even within regenerative, people who have the light bulb go off, but then get stuck in that light bulb moment instead of continuing to evolve the paradigm. Um, so mine has is, is just been observing what makes sense. And um, I, you, you grow up uh, in, in a certain manner and um, of course, you're going to fight with your parents, and I didn't mind, you know, bucking my dad a little bit on, on what types of agriculture, you know, should be going on at my place. So um, we, we would talk about things and, and, you know, some things that would or wouldn't work. And um, so, you know, if you, I, I don't know. I've been lucky in a lot of ways, and it's just been accidents and, and then observations. Um, that has, it's been a slow transition to get to where we are now. Um, you know, it's, it's putting a one cow out in the orchard and then figuring out like, oh, we could rotate, you know. Um, so th that's been a lot of it. And then, um, you know, like the rains that came and oh, we can harvest through, you know, anything, any cover crop. So, you know, um, and then the other part of it, it it's economic. Um, you know, you, we have uh, one crop. Well, we, we started with one crop, the pecans, and it took a lot of inputs. Our 15 acres of pecans, we were putting five to seven thousand dollars worth of fertilizer on every year, and this year I've completely cut that out, so it saved me money. Where we sell beef every year, so now what we used to spend on fertilizer is is now actually an income from selling beef. 
So economics has driven some of this as well as just seeing, you know, what makes sense, what works, and what's right, you know, for the soil and the health and trees. For me, it's a, uh, it's been a journey about thinking about the, the uh, hubris of man. That I really think, you know, we, we kind of have our ego out of control. Um, if we look at the landscape, like think about the Midwest, the, the incredible soils we have there, and those used to be a pile of rocks that when the glaciers got done. We're out in California, map, that's old seabed, yet they are very fertile soils. And that all came about without any of us being involved. Yet too often we think we have the answer. And having worked in a variety of places um, in the United States and outside the United States, and some, like when I was in Guatemala, that are um, very low technology available, and seeing how well they were adapted to their environment and where, for instance, USAID had come in and how that was crashing very badly. You have to back up and really read the context and understand you don't have the answers and to think about what is this piece of ground telling me. If I want to be a cattle man, then I better go find ground that's good for cows. If I want to do something with this piece of ground in front of me, then I better read this ground and understand what it's saying to me and how I need to work with it. The, the idea of, of domination is, is, I think, is a, is a short game. We can dominate at any time. But that, we've seen that even in our own bodies with our you know, Western medicine, Eastern medicine. There are, there are ways you can go that you can dominate things, but it's not holistic and it's not long term. And I think that's where I've come into this mindset of talking to people about it. What would each of you say to someone who's looking, they, maybe they're already doing some regenerative or they're deep into it, um, and they want to try one of these new tools. They want to try a silvopasture approach. Um, they want to try going more into the multi-species. What's the, what's the entry point? Safe to fail, obviously, I'm there. Um, but what, 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 from your experience, what's the tool, what's the opening? kind of a hard question. Uh, I have one example, I, I, I custom harvest other orchards that are around and um, one of them was for sale. It was way too far away from us to think about buying. But uh, this guy and his wife who were in the process of buying it while I was harvesting came out and talked to me a little bit. And um, I, we ended up talking for several hours out there just in the middle of the orchard. and. Uh, you know, he, he was talking about the fertilizer and the this and then that, and so I just tried putting a bug in his ear. But he had not been around agriculture before. And um, so I, I didn't talk to him for months and months after that, and I, and I warned him of that, hey, if you call a seed company, they're not going to sell you seed if they know what you're doing, you know. So, uh, um, so anyways, call around, talk to different people, and, and so I ran, at, ran into him at a soils health class, and he's like, man, I went off the deep end. And uh, he, at the soils health class, you know, he was um, talking a lot about the regenerative agriculture. He said, yeah, I called that seed company. I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, so catching them when they don't know anything about agriculture. Um, the, he put, sent me a picture of a month ago. He was planting a cover crop right through the middle of his orchard. And uh, he had bought, I think it was five llamas or alpacas to graze. It's a five-acre orchard. It's smaller. But yeah, he bought alpacas and llamas. Um, and then if I could talk to him face-to-face, -face, if I can get him to come out and look at my farm, and that's actually how we've done some of our grass-fed beef sales. I can, if I can talk him into coming out to my farm and look, and we walk out and we touch and, and, and smell and dig and, and look at the cows and everything else, that that's a pretty good driver and and my dad he's still extremely in the conventional mindset so whenever he comes over um he asked me so many questions he's read tons of books and and knows you know well we grew up the, the soil was mostly silicone but then there's npk and you have to replace it when you pull a crop out you know and, and so we have a lot of arguments and he'll ask questions that forces me to do research and and so i've picked up on some good books to read and, and point people in that direction so I, I don't know if there's any one, one size shoe that fits all, but. 
for me, it's always trying to understand the why. Um, what is, what's a person's why, what's important to them in life? You know, is, 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 is legacy, is it their kids, is it the future of the land, to get people to open up to new ideas. Um, one thing I think that we, I stumbled across this in the 80s, um, in, in Daring in New Zealand, and I heard Ollie talk about it last night in England, and I really think it's a, it's a concept the United States should under, adopt more of is, is this, this share farming. I know sharecropping has a bad connotation in this country, but this idea of share farming, because for instance, if you wanna bring a new species onto your ground, maybe you don't have the time to deal with it, but maybe the neighbor or somebody in the community can do that, and you will benefit from it. They will benefit from it, and, and, the, and the, the test is low. Um, for instance, we, there's, a, there's a place down the road from us, and uh, Fogland Farm, and uh, I think he ran about 35,000 pastured poultry last year. So pretty good size operation for pastured poultry. Maybe he's crept up more. And Caleb's biggest challenge is he's growing so much grass on this just beat up old farm ground. And to give you an idea, this farm ground is so hard during the rainy season, you still have to drive a three quarter or three eighths inch fiberglass rod with a mallet. You don't push it in the ground. You gotta drive it. That's how, it's like cement. But with the poultry manure grows, well his problem is he needs the grass short for the chicken houses. So he invites us down there to graze. Anybody else could come in there. And we've seen some really good positive relationships in this. And I think that everybody should think about their corner. If how, if you wanna try something new, it's not always you trying something new. It's getting someone else with their expertise to come in and try new. Um, at Tomcat, the kind of the way we introduced goats, I had been very uh, uh, aware, having dealt with goats before, that they would manage brush, they would do different things very positive. Um, first time I brought goats on a Tomcat ranch, they got off the truck and they ate brush about 30 minutes and said, to hell with this, this is not, doesn't taste good. And I got an education for the next three weeks under contract, okay? So much for what I knew. Um, we. Brought in goats again last year in the contract, different circumstance for fuel management because we've had so much fires just around the facilities, really positive. So then we went, okay, we're gonna address this differently, now we're gonna manage ourselves and we went out and got our own herd. So it's, it's utilizing other people's resources and experience for the benefit of both, I think is a really shortens, shortens your door to getting a variety of enterprises or, or tools onto the property. So I don't do stairs real well. So if you're up high, please come down to meet me. But questions? So you're easy. Um, what is the pecan farmer llama's plan with his llamas? Uh, our alpacas, is he going to harvest the wool? Um, because we use those two critters um, for guard animals in our herds of goats and sheep from coyotes. Um, I, I don't know what his plan is for those. I know he got a smoking deal on them. So <laughs> And I think that's why he went with them instead of cows or anything else. And, and the fencing around the property isn't, wasn't great. So he, he wanted something, you know, that not sheep or goats. You know, they'll find every little nook and cranny, something a little bit bigger. And I don't know how he found them, but I know he got a really good deal. And, and that's, that's what he did. Um, I couldn't. He just told me it was a really good deal. So I, I would imagine, I don't know, 50 or $100 a piece. I'll learn to shear for that. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Hey, just had a question for Mark. Um, I noticed in some of the photos you were showing doing the bale grazing and the grid patterns, it looked like you had lots of bales out through a quite a wide area, and I'm wondering, do you set those bales out pretty far in advance of where your cattle are moving? And if so, what kind of like nutrient degradation do you see in those bales when they're exposed to the elements for that long? 
So we, the easiest way is to set all the bales out ahead of time. Um, you use electric fence, um, just like you're doing a pasture, and you can control them. Um, the biggest thing we found was making sure you had enough, basically if you think about in a feedlot, bunk space, so you better have enough space when all the cows move into the next, next area, so we move them every three days. But since we're doing it before the rains, we don't get degradation of that hay. It will turn a little gray on the outside because we do, are in the fog belt. Um, this may sound funny, but we've got bales out right now. We've got rain coming in. And we ran out, and we're getting at the end of it. We tarped 20 bales. Put little hats on them, but you won't. If you get an inch of rain coming in, it'll, it, it's worth the money to go out and do that, and you just pull the tarps off. Uh, so again, it's, it's, you, we can't do it during the rainy season, so it's actually it's no different than storing hay outside. Other questions? Apologies, sorry. Um, just a quick question for, for both of you. Um, it, it was really interesting to, to hear about your own sort of learning processes. And you mentioned a lot about tools and processes for, for regenerative ag. I'm curious about um, this, this paradigm shift, how much of it is it is it about actually empowering other communities, uh, other community members uh, to actually scale up regenerative agriculture through learning processes? And what was your own sort of journey to actually be empowered to do that? Were you empowered to do that? Or was it actually kind of just fighting through the doubt? And obviously it seems like you both have an interest in, in empowering others to, to do these processes or, or else you wouldn't be here. Um, but, you know, in terms of developing those, your own set of, of tools, how do you actually scale up the learning process and encourage people to actually find adaptable uh, processes that they feel empowered to actually go through the doubt? I think it's a difficult conversation that you don't jump into the first time you meet somebody. Because part of the problem is we're hooked on tradition. And if tradition is the right thing, then we shouldn't have to change our operation because the operation we have today is how we've managed it. And if we want the operation to be different, we can't keep doing the same thing we've been doing. And that is really a hard struggle for people to get around. And if you, I think if you address that one head on, you can be very insulting. And so you have to go to the why. What is their why of what they will want to do to get them to open their mind to think about there's other possibilities? Um, in a personal classic conversation, a cousin of mine about 15 years ago when I was talking about, this is when I was working on my own, talking about different pastures seeding, and he said to me, well, Mark, ryegrass and red clover was good enough for Grandpa, it ought to be good enough for us. And I said, Scott, Grandpa left the old country, left a continent, left a culture. He made a lot of changes. That may be what he did in his lifetime. We need to open up to more things, more possibilities. So I, I, it's, there is no, I don't think there's any pattern. It's just getting people to open their mind that there are something bigger and better, but it starts with why they would want to do it. Yeah, and a, another brick to, to hit your head against on that too is <laughs> um, I, I have neighbors that, that I talk to every once in a while, and, and whenever I talk to them, they say, man, your place sure looks good, you know. You're doing something right over there, and I try to tell them, and they don't want to hear it. You know, and, and a lot of this, I don't think it's that much work, but a lot of it looks like work. And, uh, you know, getting out in your, your orchard or in your field every day, but it's only for 10 or 15 minutes. You know, I'm not spending, what, 10, 15 hours a week sitting on a tractor like we used to do. You know, it's 10 or 15 minutes a day, but they see you out there every day, and it looks like a lot of work. And, and the other thing... Um, it is the equipment. You know, everybody has equipment in their setup. You know, somebody who's set up to do corn has a few million dollars in equipment. They, they can't uh, afford to, to risk switching to something new. You know, they're set up for corn. And, and you know, it's the same it, for alfalfa down where we are. You're invested in that so heavily, you almost can't afford to switch to something else. And so th the only person I've been able to re really even talk to about it is, is the guy when he was buying his farm. He didn't come from an ag background, and, and I managed to get to him before the, 
the pesticide dealer and the herbicide dealer and the seed dealer and everybody else got to him. And, and so that was just kind of a luck. So I don't have a good answer for your question. I want to add one comment picking up on your thing about figuring out people's why because, you know, I farm, but then I also do political advocacy. And I just want to turn it there because I'm willing to bet that if we went around this room, each of you had a somewhat different reason for getting into regenerative agriculture, whether it was your family, some of you it's health issues, some of you it's you just love being outside and you started listening to the land, some of you is environmental concerns, there's all of these different reasons. Some of you are driven by passion for local economies and you want to see rural communities. We each have a different why for why we got into this. And that's something I, I have to relate to political advocacy. Carrie's probably about to throw something at me. Um, when we look at changing the system, when we look at trying to do political work or regulatory work, all of those people have their whys too. All of the people in office have the things they care about. And what's really fabulous about this movement, about what we're doing, is the only people who lose out are the big corporations and their profits. You know, everybody else wins. And if you can start thinking about the other person's why, I'm going to start using that phrasing. I really love that encapsulation. Why, it, what does that person care about? You'll find you can convince people who you figured you have nothing in common with because they're someplace else on the political spectrum. They, they, you know, their priorities are completely different than yours. Maybe they are. But their why still, there's going to be something in this for them also. So now I think we're going to take some questions from the virtual. Yeah, we are. I actually have sort of a, a litany of <laughs> questions about the orchard. So um, I'm going to ask all of them, and then you can decide which you'd like to tackle, if that's OK. Um, we tried to do something similar with a pear orchard and ran into problems with a Food Safety Modernization Act. Has that been a problem? How much space in between crowns to allow sunlight in for grass? Do you let your chickens range behind you with uh, range behind your cows? If so, do they affect your dung beetle population? And finally, with the biodiverse planting, do you have an increase in irrigation beyond what you do for the orchard? So that's a lot of questions. You can pick and choose. <laughs> And so on the uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, that's that's one that's also. I'm going to interrupt and ask you to bring your mic a little closer oh. to your mouth, just Sorry. because I think that it's folks in the back. Is that better? Thank you. All right. Sorry. Um, it, on, on the Food Safety Modernization Act, that's one that's in the back of my mind. And and when you were the cons are exempt. Um, have whoever asks a question about Food Safety Modernization Act, email me. We'll talk. <laughs> yeah, they, and, and they are, well, currently exempt, but, you know, no legit, what, what is it, legislation knows no bounds, you know, they're, it, it's coming. Um, but so I was thinking about this when you were talking about the politicians and stuff and, and um, you know, the, the legislation. So the book, uh, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal by Joel Salatin. Um, if the Food Safety Modernization Act applied to the pecan orchards, I would be operating illegally. I wouldn't change anything right now. Um, and it, that's just how I operate. I know better for my farm what some bureaucrat knows. <laughs> on, um, let's see if I can pick out one or two of the others. On, on the chickens, no, we don't pull them behind. Um, I'm just, I have, don't have a very mobile coop right now. And on the water issue, um, we can tell that we actually need less water planting the cover crops. I know they use more water, but when we used to have bare soil and you went from that by roughly seven to eight day transition of it just sopping wet to a dry lake bed, I can come back three weeks after an irrigation where I have soil cover, e either growing plants or just dead material, the way the harvesting works and stuff. Um, you'll end up with p piles of grass that just fall out the back end and you can come and dig back under those, and it's still damp right there. There's, you can see the bugs and the earthworms and everything under there. So no, there's, there's not a, co a competition for water. It's, it's way more symbiotic than competitive. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, so you've, you're up there, someone right there? This is for Mark. Um, there's a lot of managers in Mediterranean environments around the world 
that struggle with getting beyond annuals to perennials. And holistic management teaches us that uh, for population management, we look to age structure. And if there's too many young plants, there's too much disturbance. Too many old plants, not enough disturbance. Is it as simple in the success you've made in moving to perennials that you just increased your recovery periods? The simple answer is no. And what is the answer? I don't know, okay? Um, we do want annuals to stay. First thing, let me, let, me, let me correct in case anybody thought, we are not a perennial dominated pastures by any means. Um, those charts I showed you were based on detection, not on population. One of the things I'm seeing is we're starting to get more population, but more importantly, I feel like we're starting to get robustness. The, the plants are having an opportunity to actually express themselves. Um, too much of our landscape is, in my belief, is not the environment that native perennials evolved in because of the legacy of the farming that went on. So managing that uh, recover, recovery period is very important, but also actually bringing some chaos to the system. Sometimes we actually have too much litter. We're on the coast, as I said earlier, uh, with a fog belt. We don't wind up, bare ground is not an issue we have. And we have had places where we've actually taken it down on purpose to be too much bare ground for us, and that has actually allowed the perennials to poke their heads up and come out. They had too much competition from the litter. So I feel like over time, the more chaos we can create, looking back at our grazing patterns, what we've done, finding places that we have had, not had long recoveries, or not technically overgrazed it in my mind, and applying that actually gives us an opportunity to move ahead. But I don't have a recipe for how to do this all. We're still trying to figure it out. I hope that answered your question. I think ending on the comment, we're all still trying to, we're just trying to figure this out, may be the best summation. Thank you both so much for those excellent talks.